Now let's go to the next slide. And we can see here is the aerial view of the Giza pyramid complex, which contains uh, the Khufu pyramid, which is the left one, then Harfa pyramid, Hafri pyramid, which is in the middle, and then a uh, much smaller one to the right, which is uh, Makauri uh, uh, pyramid. And uh, you can, uh, it seems that this middle pyramid is uh, taller than uh, the le left one, which is uh, optical illusion because it's slightest steeper angle and also it's uh, the basis is higher. We should mention that the whole complex, which uh, has area of exceeding 13 acres, uh, it leveled uh, with the, uh, discrepancy of small fraction of an inch. That's incredible for that time. Uh, you see, we're talking about uh, 45, 46 uh, centuries before with very limited techniques and we're talking about that uh, precision. Uh, another thing is they were built, uh, the pyramids were built uh, with uh, sites being north uh, north, uh, south, uh, and so on, and west and east, correspondingly, uh, with this, I, I forgot some minutes, angle, I mean, angle or minutes uh, deviation. Again, uh, huge precision for that time. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Before we go to the next slide, um, what do you attribute this precision to the, to the knowledge of astrology? Yeah, no, not astrology, but astronomy. Yes, uh, definitely uh, Greek, uh, I would say priests, scientists at the time it was the same. They uh, had many accumulated many uh, centuries probably of uh, watching the sun, the, uh, the stars and uh, orienting themselves and uh, knowing the times of the year because uh, there were certain uh, practical reasons for doing this. One, you have to be able to uh, orient yourself in time because that was the uh, time control, the uh, time or season uh, would control the behavior of the Nile, which was a matter of death and life and death uh, because the whole uh, life in Egypt uh, was built around the uh, change in denial, uh, it's, uh, rise of water, subsidence uh, and so on. So all the uh, agriculture activity. And you cannot uh, not to know the timing without knowing the, uh, the orientation of stars and sun and so on. So that's to what I attributed. Um, we just wanted to also mention that anybody has any questions or wanted to yeah, say this, uh, Michael, please go ahead and ask. Uh, this is an interactive type of um, uh, presentation. So one thing I also is just wanted to add, this is not, I, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the pyramids are, 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 is not only what's part of a complex, they also have temples, shrines, and all the other aspects that pyramid just happens to be the largest ones and, and saved, I guess were saved the best, but there is other things that they have, were built uh, to complement pyramids in those times. Um, Absolutely correct. And there, there are also Sphinx on the same Giza complex. Uh, it hides uh, beside this uh, middle pyramid, you have this great Sphinx, which was, uh, I believe it was done kind of for, uh, if I remember correctly, Humphrey's wife, uh, which is not certain, but that's at least uh, some sources attributed to her, which is uh, obviously, you know, it's a lion with a human face. <coughs> uh, by the way, Mikhail? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a quick comment. Um, I think the ang getting the angles very accurate is fairly tricky. Getting level ground requires precision work. It's not all that... I think what they did back at the time is they would build a 
a water channel, probably a stone water channel, and right. give that just a short time to settle, and that will give you a very precise uh, yeah. measure of, of level on all, yeah. all around, even around a large area. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thanks. Hey, Kettlewitz, Ava, just a quick question. Uh, did they have to uh, bring in, it's limestone, correct? Yes. Did they have to bring it in from other places, the limestone, yes, other countries? No, not from other countries. They, the quarries were some, uh, I don't remember by, by memory, 40, 60 kilometers or miles from the site. I don't remember exactly, but okay. that, that order of magnitude. Uh, Mikhail, I guess yeah. another. I guess some of the pyramids were, I guess, either softer stone or mud brick inside, and then a sheet sheeting of limestone on the outside. Right. Were, were these things massive limestone blocks, or were they limestone slabs over a, uh, say, a mud brick core over a brick core? Uh, I don't know whether, I, I honestly, I don't remember whether all the pyramids were uh, uh, embraced in this uh, limestone cover. I believe the very first one obviously didn't, wasn't, were not, because we will see this Joseph's pyramid, which was a step one. And if I remember correctly, they started uh, after some time in the later times, like Middle Kingdom and so on, they started building these pyramids uh, with uh, of mud bricks again, and uh, no, not stone blocks. That's again uh, kind of confirms the trend that they uh, were lacking resources, which old kingdom pharaohs had at their disposal. And uh, I don't think that this mud brick type pyramids that they had this uh, shiny limestone cover. Uh, I'm not sure, but from what I saw, I didn't want to put it here, not to overwhelm this. So I kind of rely on memory of what I read, but those pyramids didn't look like they were this polished. And obviously there were pyramids, even uh, the one, the earlier ones from old kingdom era, uh, that uh, I believe this, the very first one was, we can, if we go a couple of slides back, uh, uh, no, no, there where we have uh, this uh, list of pyramids. Uh, more, one more, and one more. Oh yeah, here, okay. Uh, no, sorry, I, it's not here. It's not included here. Okay. Actually, maybe it is included. This uh, Sheferu pyramid, uh, I believe uh, it had actually here, the Sheferu pharaoh, he had three pyramids built for him. Here only two are listed. And uh, some of this, one of these pyramids had, uh, it were uh, early attempts to uh, build really big ones. And they had uh, uh, their, uh, they didn't have straight, uh, straight uh, sides. They were uh, kind of, uh, not, not a regular shape. They were, they had to uh, go from steeper angle to shallow one because the pyramid was at danger of collapsing. And then another one, I believe it was a kind of so-called bent pyramid. So uh, they, it, first attempts of building really big edifices, they were not very successful, but somehow by the time they started building Hufu pyramid, they uh, became uh, really masters. Okay, let's go. Uh, yeah, that's the plan. Uh, and this basically just shows, again, it shows where the Sphinx is located and uh, uh, other things, but we can go to the next slide now. Uh, this gives you, that's the Great Pyramid or Hufu Pyramid. You can see these blocks. Uh, different sources give a uh, different number for the uh, average size of the block. Uh, some say 1.5 ton, another 2.5 tons. So let's say two tons plus minus half 
And of course, it's an average size. Uh, the blocks became smaller uh, uh, towards the top of the pyramid. And also we have huge granite black blocks, uh, which weigh up to 80 tons. These huge blocks, they uh, form uh, either entrance to the pyramid, we can see to the next slide and we can go already there or they also form uh, the top of the ch burial chambers. Here you can see this entrance to the Great Pyramid. You can see this uh, top of the entrance is formed by blocks which are much larger than uh, the, the rest of them. And you can see people there. So you can get an idea about the size of average block, any, any block there. And uh, we can go now to the next slide. Which Mikhail, gives, uh, yes. Did you have to walk all the way up just to get in? Uh, probably. I wasn't there, honestly. But <laughs> <laughs> I never but, knew that. I just thought you sort of walked in. Uh, well, first of all, this wasn't supposed to for some anybody to walk in when. Well, so that's true. It was sealed, uh, but we know that many people who were not supposed to be there got there and robbed. Uh, the uh, burial chambers and so on but so obviously those people were pretty uh, kind of <laughs> ambitious and were able to go up i just learned something thank you <laughs> you're welcome and so here you can see a radiography imaging of uh, uh, king's uh, burial chamber uh, and you can see these huge blocks that form the uh, uh, roof of this chamber. And we can go to the next slide now. Okay, that's uh, the uh, cross section of the pyramid. And you can see there is one burial chamber uh, at the very bottom of the subterranean chamber, and then one which is called queen chamber. And then the, at the very top, there is king chamber. And uh, one of the sources I read gives the history that's first uh, since the uh, builder of this pyramid, by the way, this was uh, the building of this pyramid is attributed to uh, Heminu or Heman, in other words, uh, who was uh, Hufu's vizier and he was the architect of this pyramid. Uh, so when uh, he started building this, uh, he didn't know how long, obviously, the pharaoh will live. So he was in a rush to build at least one burial chamber because it was considered very uh, bad for the soul of the uh, pharaoh, for, for that matter, for, for a person uh, who uh, uh, died and doesn't have a burial place. So the subterranean chamber was uh, built first. And then since uh, Pharaoh continued to be in good health, they continued building. And then the next one, the so-called queen chamber was ready and he continued to be in good health. So he uh, lived uh, through either entire or, or almost entire building of the pyramid. And so they were able to build this uh, king's chamber uh during his lifetime and uh, uh speaking of technical stuff you can see this king's chamber it has several uh, uh below the between the chamber and the room there are several look like several layers they were uh, so-called relief uh relief chambers or relief uh, structures which were made to uh, relieve uh, pressure of uh, all the material uh, above it on the ch to prevent chamber from collapsing. Uh, it's not absolutely from the engineering standpoint. I cannot say it's pretty clear to me why they did it. I don't see how that would relieve it. But anyway, that's, I just wanted to mention this. And uh, we can now go to the next slide. Now that's, uh, we are coming to the, in my view, to the uh, kind of focal point of this presentation of the whole story of the building the pyramids. This is the fact, which is the second uh, astonishing fact. The first one I'll name later. So 
the pyramid has a mass of six and a half million tons. Different sources give the duration of this pyramid building from 10 to 30 years. Most of the sources say between 20 and 30 years. So let's say between them 25 years. And uh, obviously there are 365 days a year. And uh, let's assume that uh, building continued uh, 12 hours every day. And knowing that there are 60 minutes an hour and we make this simple calculation, we'll come up with the result that every minute, one ton of finished product had to be put in and be done with this. So just imagine, realize this fact. For 25 years, every day for 12 hours, one ton of finished product should be put in. There is absolutely no way for any correction, anything, anything to fix, which was done in, uh, improperly. That's it. 25 years, half a day, every year, every, every day, no, no vacations, no weekends, no nothing. And the most astonishing fact to me, that to be able to do this without correction, the whole design had to be prepared, verified, and somehow recorded. Oh. How this could have been done, I have no idea. I, by the way, it's not in one of the things I read. They said they something like put uh, on the scale one to one. They put this on the side. I, that's I almost read it exactly what was said. I don't know what they was meant. I don't know how you can put it. How, would you use uh, papyrus? What other means of recording design? And this design cannot be just held in one head, like this visor uh, hammer, because uh, there is no absolutely assurance that this visor will survive the duration of this building. That's one thing. Secondly, he, it's just physically impossible for one man to control the whole process. There should be several people, or actually many people, who would be controlling the process, who should have access to this design and know what to do, when, and how. And this many people, for, this, for them to have this access to this design, this design should be somehow laid out how this was done with their means, how this design was verified for, because there was no way to have any correction afterwards. That's to me the most astonishing fact. We don't have any, uh, any indication how this was done. Now, uh, uh, this site was visited by uh, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus who uh, is named the father of history. Uh, and uh, we'll read what he, uh, his um, description of this. He, by his estimate, it were uh, 400,000 men uh, who built there for 20 years and with working with three months shifts, 100,000 men at a time. Today's estimate, they are much more modest, uh, 10,000 people at a time. But let me read uh, what Herodotus was uh, uh, writing in his book. Uh, the pyramid was made like stairs with some, uh, which some call steps and other stairs. When this its first form was completed, the workmen used short wooden logs as levers to raise the rest of the stones. They heaved up the blocks from the ground onto the first tire of, of steps. When the stone had been raised, it was set on another lever that stood on the first tire. And the lever again used to lift it from this tire to the next one. It may be that there was a new lever on each tire of steps, or perhaps there was only one lever quite portable, which they carried up each tire in turn. 
I leave this uncertain and, and as both possibilities were mentioned. But this is certain that uh, the upper part of the pyramid was finished off first when the I... next. Okay. That doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, traffic, right? Sorry, I was listening to something. Okay. Uh, could you mute yourself, please? Arina, uh, can you move your line, please? Uh, so let me continue. Uh, so, but this is certain that the upper part of the pyramid was finished off first, then the next below it, the last of all the base and the lowest part. The site was also visited by uh, a Roman uh, historian, uh, Diodorus Siculus. Uh, it was first century BC. Uh, the Herodotus was in fifth century BC. So Herodotus was there 2000 years after the uh, completion of the pyramid and uh, Diodorus uh, 400 years or 300 years afterwards. So what uh, did Her uh, Siculus uh, wrote? And it is said the stone was transported a great distance from Arabia, and that these edifices were raised by means of earthen ramps, since machines for lifting had not yet been invented in those days. And most surprising it is that although such large structures were raised in an area surrounded by sand, no trace remains of other ramps or, by, or the dressing of the stones so that it seems not the result of the patient labor of men, but rather as if whole complex were set down entire upon the surrounding uh, by some God. Uh, now Egyptians try to make a marvel of those things, alleging that the ramps were made of salt and natron and that uh, when the river was turned against them, uh, it melted uh, them clean away and obliterated every uh, trace without the use of human labor. But in truth, truth is most certainly that not done this way. Rather the same multitude of workmen who raised the mounds return to entire, the entire mass again to its original place. For they say that 360,000 men were constantly employed in the persecution of the work. Yet the entire edifice was hardly finished at the end of 20 years. So uh, here we have two, uh, two witnesses, obviously uh, long after the com uh, completion of the uh, work, but uh, that's at least two closest in time witnesses to the event. Uh, initially, uh, it was thought that uh, the uh, laboring people were slaves. Uh, today's archeologists dispute this, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, uh, Mark Lerner uh, from Harvard and his uh, Egyptian uh, colleague, I don't have his uh, name readily available. They had, uh, they worked on the side in the very end of 20th century and uh, in the, this century as well. And uh, they found that uh, the uh, adjacent to the uh, uh, pyramid complex, there was a work, workman town. And this town uh, contained uh, living quarters, uh, bakeries, breweries, and kitchens. and. Uh, also, they were able to find uh, evidence of their diet, which was bread, beef, and fish uh, that were the staples of the diet. And uh, slaves were not fed uh, with the, that kind of uh, food. And also the uh, site uh, had a hospital and the cemetery and obviously uh, some skeletons uh, in the cemetery, they uh, carried, uh, traces of uh, traumas, which is uh, 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 attributable to the uh, traumas from, from the building uh, of the pyramid. And this uh, uh, 
the slide uh, shows the picture of uh, which was uh, excavated by a uh, learner, learner group of uh, the, the so-called dorm where 50 people would, were able to sleep. So I believe today is a kind of pretty clear conclusion that it was done <clears throat> by free workers and that they were skilled workers because uh, obviously it was uh, this building uh, required significant substantial skills and uh, today's conclusion at least of predominant view that it was done by uh, workers uh, can completely devoted for this, or maybe workers which split their uh, assignments between this and agricultural things when uh, uh, Nile dictated uh, arrival of a new season. And we can go now to the next slide. Well, just uh, one comment. Sure. Radas wrote an interesting fact in his observation. He said, when I went on the pyramids, I, I actually could see a sign of workers eating garlic and the signs were on top of the <laughs> pyramid. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, um, just to agree to your point, uh, uh, what recently had been also um, discovered that uh, the workers were paid in beer. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 mentioned, I mentioned breweries here. The right. breweries were included in this, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Now uh, we have we have the numbers which we uh, determined that we need to put or somebody we need to put uh, one ton of finished product every minute through the entire uh, building process, and we have evidence of two uh, historians who visited the site. And uh, at least in one of them mentioned ramps and also mentioned uh, cranes or levers. And so obviously uh, the st first straight, most straightforward approach would be to say, okay, let's assume straight ramp was used for the building, assisted with the crane. So uh, if we assume that it was a straight ramp, and uh, here uh, what is shown is three stages of the building, uh, you can see that, yeah, at the early stages, uh, ramp is uh, not that big and uh, it kind of looks reasonable, but the further you go, the larger the ramp becomes, and then eventually they are considering that uh, inclination of slope of ramp would be 8%, which was uh, by trial and error developed like uh, the most steep angle uh, along which uh, this uh, moving uh, stones on the slides uh, could be accomplished then the volume of the ramp becomes uh, close or maybe even higher, at least let's say comparable with the volume of the pyramid. So the work amount should be doubled actually, as far as amount of weight which should be, could be moved. So that looks uh, not very encouraging. So uh, people started looking at other options. And if you go to the next slide, uh, we can see other options which were considered. One would be a zigzagging ramp, and another would be a ramp, uh, kind of incomplete ramp going uh, through the structure of the pyramid itself, and then a spiral ramp. Uh, the common thing between all of them is that they use the pyramid itself as a part of the structure supporting the ramp. And uh, a, each of these, so theoretically, uh, each one is doable. Uh, Mikhail, but, oh. Yes, please. Oh, Mikhail Seva, would they have uh, done these ramps off the engineers off site to see which one would work better? Well, there are different experiments. You can, if you go on YouTube, you can see different trials, people doing this, but uh, the uh, most detailed trials, they were kind of cheating because they were using forklift for <laughs> moving stuff. 
up somewhat. So still there are trials which they can say, okay, this could be done, but on much smaller scale, obviously not comparable with the pyramid. Because and, they have to walk up these ramps. So. Right, and the, and the higher you go, the more difficult it becomes, obviously. Yeah. So uh, again, this uh, considering these three types of ramp, there is no argument which can uh, completely eliminate the possibility of using one of them. It's possible. Obviously, it's not very convenient. It's still, um, it's still uh, a lot of uh, volume, building volume and labor and so on. Uh, using this ramp, uh, talking about zigzagging ramp, it's uh, inconvenient of moving stuff. Uh, obviously, straight ramp makes it more convenient uh, to move the stuff, but it takes a larger volume. And uh, spiral in the ramp, uh, and I should mention external spiral the ramp, which shown here, uh, that makes particularly difficult uh, maintaining uh, straight angles, uh, edges of the pyramid. And uh, so that's almost uh, eliminates the possibility of using this ramp. And if we go to the next slide. Can I make one comment, Mikhail? Sure. sure. Uh, around the question of models, um, people should be aware that this was not the first pyramid that the Egyptians built. Right. The Egyptians had been building pyramids for a long time and very frequently they collapsed. I mentioned, I mentioned this in the beginning. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. So they did have, practice in seeing right. your practical trial and error practice about what worked yeah. and what didn't. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, this, and using the ramps uh, was most likely assistant with the cranes or levers. And uh, Egyptians had this so-called shaduf, which they used for lifting water from, from a river or some other water sources. So this kind of shaduf like structure shown here, and obviously this can be done, but again, uh, whether you can move uh, this shaduf up the steps uh, along the pyramid's height, it becomes questionable the higher you go. The reason is that uh, the higher you go, the smaller the width of the step available for putting this shaduf. And I believe in very top, if I recall correctly, it's 18 inches, which is very tough to put this shaduf, considering that you are dealing with the blocks of uh, two ton range of weight. Uh, but still, uh, most likely uh, in some shape or form, these cranes were, were used and uh, ramps, at some stages of constructions probably were used as well. To what extent, we don't know. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, another theory was, and it was done by uh, French uh, Henri uh, Uden, I believe, uh, I'm talking from memory. It's uh, today's, not today's, he was working in 1990s, French architect. Uh, who decided to look, he came up with the idea of using internal ramp. And this internal ramp, of course, it's uh, kind of squeezed space, but on the other hand, it allows uh, to maintain the uh, upper part, uh, outer part of the pyramid intact. It's not affected by the ramp itself and therefore maintain straight lines of the edges. And so uh, this ramp, again, it would be supported uh, by the pyramid, by the main body of the pyramid. And uh, you would have to have uh, wider uh, open spaces uh, where you change the direction of the ramp. But uh, they, uh, after his design, they used, uh, he used the French company the um, uh, salt, I believe it. I believe it's the same company which uh, manufactures uh, French uh, uh, air fighters planes, at least uh, the same name, maybe different company. And uh, they, they had uh, computer modeling and they came up with the idea, yes, it's all possible. They were able to 
go uh, step by step and confirm that it is do this is doable. Now, I don't have a slide for this, but what's interesting, they are uh, uh, some, I forgot who, who was the company, they uh, maintained uh, or conducted a mic microgravimetrical study of the pyramid. And they found uh, this uh, some traces of this, seems like there is a, uh, internal uh, ramp inside. I don't know how they measured. So obviously, uh, how sensitive it should be if it's void or uh, solid body. So they change. Uh, I I don't know how whether this gravimetrical method how it's designed. Probably they mentioned it's available. But anyway, so. Uh, they came up with the uh, with the traces of void spiral and void inside the pyramid, and then they approached. And I believe it was the very end of 1990s. They approached the uh, Egyptian government, uh, asking to allow them to do uh, non-invasive uh, research, like uh, uh, X-ray or something of this kind. And uh, as far as I know, it, it's, they didn't have, uh, they were promised permission, but then, then uh, denied. And so it's, so the process going on, There's, there was no research done, which could have confirmed that there is a spiral in uh, internal ramp. And we can now go to the next slide. Uh, just to add, uh, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. uh, in 2007, 2006, French did send the robots. Uh, they were built by this guy Hoffman, German, you know, Volkswagen, and two robots went inside mm -hmm. and searched. Uh, well, maybe that was the that was the outcome of the permission that they received. Okay. Um, they the robots were not able to go all the way up to the chamber. Mm -hmm. but they there was a lot of picture. What pictures were taken and so forth. Mm -hmm. or so on and uh, just also add to French research um, they spent uh, over a hundred years French uh, mm -hmm. searching uh, Geoff Joffrey's um, pyramid and mm -hmm. uh, and restoring it uh, mm -hmm. it was in really bad shape prior to that so over a hundred years French are involved in restoring that pyramid jo 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 Joseph so Jeff there's no the first pyramid, Joffrey's, yeah. Okay, I don't know what pyramid is this. This is the first one you mentioned. There was a ah, Joseph's. Joseph's, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, but Joseph's was uh, it was very different from the Great Pyramid. Correct. First, it was a step uh, wise design. It was like several mastabas put on the top of each other. Uh, it wasn't covered with limestone, and uh, it was built of relatively small blocks. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, what what you you just mentioned? Uh, I recall another fact that uh, people who were on the site they saw a fox going in one of these notches, uh, which would be considered this uh, located uh, at the where uh, internal ramp changed direction, uh, went inside the pyramid and disappeared. So <laughs> obviously it's not a strong evidence, but they uh, thought that, okay, maybe uh, there is something going inside the pyramid long enough. Okay, now speaking of, uh, transporting large uh, weights, uh, that's probably could be done only using ramps. And this is the uh, picture here is taken from Jehutihotep's tomb. It's decoration of the Jehutihotep's uh, who is, uh, uh, provincial governor of uh, 12th dynasty. And uh, this shows how uh, uh, his stature, uh, which is considered weighing about 60 tons was transported by uh, 172, if I remember correctly, people. 
and you can see a person uh oops the slide move okay thank you uh the person at the front of the uh, sledge uh or the uh he uh, pours water in front of it. uh the uh research done uh, uh in the current time in modern time show that when you pour water you can reduce the friction by 50 percent roughly but it's a somewhat tricky process it should be a right amount of water if you pour too much then uh, it becomes muggy and then friction actually increases. So, but obviously, obviously people were, have enough time to become skilled in this. And we can go now to the next slide. Okay. Uh, now, uh, obviously, uh, there was uh, no shortage of hypotheses how the pyramids were built, and uh, because we uh, we discussed this, okay, it could be ramp uh, and and cranes, but uh, it's still uh, very problematic to do it, and uh, people started looking at alternative ways of building the pyramid, and one was that uh, limestone uh, <clears throat> was uh, uh, dissolved and, uh, and uh, mixed with water. And then this paste would be uh, transported there and put uh, uh, in certain uh, wooden shapes and then solidify in place. And that definitely could be done uh, much more flexible and not say easier, but flexibility definitely increases. So uh, this was research. And uh, I believe this theory was discar uh, discouraged uh, because what they found out that uh, 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 this uh, concrete, uh, this uh, limestone was it was natural limestone quarried at Makatan formation. It's not a solidified uh, limestone slurry. Uh, one other thing uh, against uh, using this uh, hypothesis is that for solidifying this, you have to heat it up, and the amount of wood required for this would be enormous. And there wouldn't be no enough wood in Egypt to allow doing this. So at least for now, unless any more arguments are uh, made, this theory is discarded. We can now go to the next slide. Uh, uh, in the recent years, there was a big discovery, uh, a diary of Mer. Mer was a middle, uh, ranking official uh, with the title of inspector who was overseeing a uh, process at limestone quarry from where limestone was transported to the Giza site. And uh, uh, his notes taken for several months would show how much limestone was uh, mined and how it was sent and so on. And uh, all this was basically uh, documents that this process was in existence and uh, definitely this uh, actual limestone was uh, quarried and uh, sent uh, to the Giza site. Mikhail? So, yes, please. Is it me or is that sounds like an ice cream truck? No, it's, it's ice cream truck. Uh, oh, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. <laughs> I can tell send it to you, teleport it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, so yes, that's the evidence that it was a, an actual yeah. limestone and uh, the process. Yeah, the process involved uh, quarrying limestone and uh, transporting it to the site. And we're gonna go to the next slide. <clears throat> uh, 
in uh, as recently as 2018, uh, team of archaeologists from uh, France and uh, England, they found a ramp which uh, from the uh, mining site Hetnab, which uh, allowed to come up with the idea which could really uh, make uh, explaining uh, that ramps could be could have been used much easier because using of this process, uh, which will come up later, look later, next slide, uh, uh, based on their discovery, would allow to go to 20% of slope. That's a huge difference and uh, drastically reduces the volume and size of the ramps. And we can go now to the next slide, which very clearly will show how this was done. Uh, so what they found, they found the ramp. Uh, on each side of it, there were steps and there were holes along the ramp, uh, which they uh, surmised were used uh, for uh, installing small, uh, well not small, but wood, wooden uh, poles. And this pose would make uh, pulling the uh, sledge with the stone much easier because you can push and not push, but you can uh, use people from both sides, from the behind and from the front. And you also, uh, there is also some uh, safety uh, measure here, which can allow kind of, uh, with it, because when the rope goes around this pole, Obviously, you know Euler uh, 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 equation or Euler allows just the friction around the pole allows you using pretty small force uh, to prevent movement of weight downward. So that makes it much more, uh, much easier to achieve and much safer to, to perform. So that another argument of using ramps for the uh, building of the pyramids. Uh, we can go to the next slide now. Now, from uh, more or less, I would say, uh, reasonable, my mundane, I would say, theories, we come up to somewhat uh, more outrageous. And this is one, promoted by a person whose uh, his name is Paul uh, High. And he, he is Australian, I guess, and he uh, wrote uh, an uh, how you say, essay or write-up, prepared writing on how, in his view, uh, the uh, pyramids were built. And he, uh, uses uh, Ezekiel uh, writing, uh, the book of Ezekiel and uh, also Herodotus writing and combines this uh, and also excavated so-called uh, Petri rockers, which were actually, we can see it in the next slides, were actually excavated on the uh, pyramid building sites. And uh, that's what he uh, suggests that uh, there were uh, four this uh, so-called rockers. They were placed on four sides of the uh, of the block, and that essentially may will make it. It's not a wheel, but it's kind of more or less round form. And then you can we can go to the next slide, which will make it easier, to, and even to the next one. Uh, here you can see these rockers that's were excavated on the and they are different size and they were rockers uh, the largest one weigh about a meter long and uh, that's about what is needed for an average block uh, to be able to kind of to uh, you put this four rockers on each uh, side of the block and essentially turn it into a wheel and then put in a rope 
uh, around it, and we can go to the next slide for this. Uh, you can pull this, pull this contraption upstairs, doing this from the opposite side of the pyramid. And, uh, and uh, using the uh, rule of lever, uh, you can see that the uh, way uh, force which will be applied to the upper rope would be uh, two, two or more times, it depends on the particular geometry, uh, less than the weight of the block. But even if it's uh, not this, not kind of putting this aside, it still uh, allows you to do it, to do the construction without ramp and doing this, uh, if you go to one slide back, we can see the schematics of the process. You see uh, there are, uh, let's say 10, I believe 10 ropes from each side and you can pull this uh, round blocks from the opposite side across the top of the pyramid you can pull them from the ground up to the uh, upper location and then uh, you take off these uh, rockers and then uh, you can use uh, sledges or other means and just put this block in place. So uh, he calculated that uh, 40, uh, 40, uh, yeah, 10, 10 on each of each side. So 40 groups of people can uh, achieve this uh, in uh, 20 years using this medium sized block. Uh, that's, <laughs> it's whether it was used or not, I cannot say. Uh, there's no reason to discourage it kind of right off but uh, it's pretty exotic, of course. And obviously if somebody loses a rope, uh, <laughs> the result would be tremendous and spectacular. But anyway, that's one of the theories which we cannot ignore, we should mention this. And then uh, we can go to the probably, it will be last slide now and the next one. And we will look at this, uh, watch this video, which gives another uh, potential way of uh, building the pyramid, which uh, <laughs> at least is funny and uh, very inventive, I would say. And we can discuss the technical details of it after we watch the video. So Zach, please uh, start the video. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, uh, no, no sound yet. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay. yeah we can see the screen. In building the pyramids. Much of what shaped his ideas and then formulate his process was already evident and established. The pyramid precinct was already there, 22 feet wide and 33 feet deep. There was evidence of a canal and there was a covered causeway. In 450 BC, Nearly 2,000 years after the construction of the pyramids, the Greek historian Herodotus traveled to Egypt. Yeah, we lost the sound. Walkway used for ceremonial purposes. Chris saw a pipe, a culvert too engineered and far too robust for such a simple function. With these parts of the puzzle already in place, Chris began to construct his own method. The project would begin by putting all of the infrastructure in place, 
The canal would be dug in the Nile, connected to the limestone quarry, and as close to the pyramid site as possible. A harbour would be built on the canal, and a roofed causeway built from the harbour to the pyramid build area. A moat, that is the precinct, would be dug around the limestone outcrop and filled with water. The workforce would be told that any rock protruding through the water needs chipping off. Once all the protruding stone has been removed, the water level would be lowered and the process repeated. The whole area inside the moat need not be levelled, only around the first metres in. It is imperative the perimeter blocks are precisely levelled for structural strength like the perimeter walls of a house. The interior is less important and there is little need to remove rock only to replace it with blocks. Once the water level has been dropped to around 30 millimetres around the full perimeter of the pyramid base and no rock is protruding, the foundations are level and ready to receive the blocks. As soon as the project starts and infrastructure is being put in place, quarrying and shaping the blocks can begin. An enormous amount of blocks would be completed by the time the pyramid site is ready to accept them. When limestone is first quarried, it is a relatively soft rock which hardens when exposed to the CO2 in the atmosphere. By placing the blocks straight into water after they're released from the quarry face, the stone will stay softer and more easily worked with copper tools. By shaping the blocks in the water, the water surface can be used as a constant level. By moving floats around the blocks, they could be easily turned in the water and all six sides leveled and shaped. Furthermore, working in water is also a more pleasant, cool, dust-free environment. The outer casing blocks would be quarried upstream at the quarry at Tura. A groove would be precisely carved into the quarry floor and every block would be placed into the groove during shaping. By using the water surface as a level, Every block placed into the groove would produce exactly the same angled face, which would line up perfectly when placed. The casing block angle can be checked by using a simple water level. The quarrying process can take place all year round. Once shaped, the blocks would have floats attached and then left in the store area on the quarry floor. Ideally, the floats would be made from cedar wood. The density of limestone is around 2.5 ton per cubic meter. When placed in water, each cube displaces one ton of water, so you only need 1.5 ton of buoyant material attached to float a stone block. Cedar wood has a density of around 500 kilograms per cube, so around three cubes of cedar wood would be required to float each cube of limestone. The amount of buoyant material required could be massively reduced by either hollowing out the wood or replacing the wood with more buoyant material. But then, as now, Egypt was not blessed with large forests and an abundance of timber, so the floats would be made from sealed papyrus matting wrapped around inflated animal skins. Papyrus grew in abundance, and the whole population knew how to work it, making everyday products from shoes to curtains with it. Papyrus buoyancy properties were well known and had been used for millennia to make simple rafts. Animal skins were commonly used to store liquids such as wine and water. When empty and inflated, they make excellent floats. By having the floats pre-attached to the blocks, they would float in the water, not on it. So saving thousands of man-hours trying to load the multi-ton blocks on top of unstable rafts. The blocks would require far less buoyant material to float them in the water due to the Archimedes principle of displacement. No blocks will be lost to the river floor due to capsizing, as any block floating low can just have more buoyancy attached. If floating a few tons of stone blocks seems improbable to you, then consider right now we have oil tankers sailing on the oceans weighing several thousand tons. When it comes to size and weight, anything can float. The majority of the pyramid building workforce would have been farmers and only available during the three month flood season when their fields were underwater and unworkable. When flood season begins, the Nile would rise and deepen the water in the quarry floor. Thousands of blocks would float up ready for transportation. Multiple blocks could be roped together 
often using either men in simple reed boats or cattle on a towpath be dragged up towards the Giza harbour. Leading from the harbour all the way up to the pyramid precinct is a covered causeway. The causeway is like a water pipe and totally filled with water from bottom to top. The bottom of the causeway has two gates built into it. The lower gate is level with the water in the harbour, while the upper gate is around eight metres further up the causeway at a much higher level. The higher gate is closed, sealing off the pipe and holding all the water in a bulb. The lower gate is then opened. Although the upper gate stands on a higher plane than the lower gate, the water will stay in place because it is not exposed to atmospheric pressure. It will act like water in a glass pint pot when turned upside down in a water-filled sink, with the water staying in place even though it's above the sink's water level. Atmospheric air pressure is the equivalent of a 25-foot high column of water. With the bottom gate open, blocks can be floated into the causeway. When the space between the two gates is full of blocks, the lower gate can be closed and the upper gate opened. The blocks will then float upwards towards the water-filled precinct. Due to the pressure of water on the bottom gates, an extra pair of gates will be built around halfway up the causeway to reduce this pressure. An endless rope will be thread through the floor of the causeway and the blocks attached to speed up the flotation through the tube. After levelling the precinct, the moat would be semi-refilled with water. The blocks would float up the causeway and into the water-filled precinct. The first blocks to be placed are Tura angled casing stones. They would be floated around the precinct and lowered into position along a precise, remarked line. When building a house, the perimeter brickwork is placed first to give the building its precise shape and strength, with the roof sitting on the perimeter brickwork and the majority of the internal wall not being load-bearing. Be it a house or a jigsaw, by starting and joining the perimeter pieces, the uniform shape is made. The interior will be then easily sorted out. The same will apply to pyramid building. Get the outer blocks precisely placed and the structure will have the right shape. The first few layers behind the facing blocks would need to be precisely put and joined together to give the structure inherent strength. Due to the lower blocks not being raised above the precinct height, larger blocks can be placed, giving a strong foundation to the building. As each block layer is placed, it is checked for level against the water's surface. Adjustments would then be made to the blocks. When a layer has been completed and level checked, more water is added to the precinct moat, making the water deeper, so that the next layer can be floated into position. This process would continue until the water is level with the top of the precinct wall, which was around 8 metres high. When the first few layers have been positioned and are nearly level with the precinct wall, the blocks will have to be raised above the precinct water level. By building a lift shaft onto the side of the pyramid, it would recreate a similar structure to the causeway. Again, build two separated gates at the bottom of the shaft, fill the shaft with water, and again, close the second gate to hold the water in the shaft. Open the first gate, and float in numerous blocks. Then shut the first gate, open the second gate, and the block will float up the summit of the pyramid. To keep water pressure down on the lower gates, every 15 metres or so, additional pairs of gates will be built into the shaft. Here we see blocks floating up the water lift shaft.
During the process of building the water shaft, the waste side of a facing block would be used to create a perfect seal, as it already starts at the correct angle. Here we see the process of extending the water shaft as the builders complete a layer of the pyramid. The final facing blocks are moved into place and the temporary wall is extended above. Either mud and masonry walls or a wooden box will be built around and above the lift shaft to form a temporary structure to seal in the water. Here we see an example using the mud and masonry wall. Once the top of the shaft is extended with the mud bricks, it is flooded with water. Because the quantity of water it contains is small compared to the shaft, it doesn't require the same level of reinforcement. Then, each of the blocks needed to create the next level are floated up and into place until the layer is complete. The lift shaft system requires the shaft to be heightened less than a metre for each pyramid level rise, taking relatively little material and time to build compared to the heightening, widening and lengthening of the traditional ramp theory for each level rise of the pyramid. The shaft wall could be anywhere up to three metres thick, circumventing any issues regarding water pressure. Further to this, the shaft would be waterproof. There are many ways to achieve this given the materials available at the time. These include overlapping animal skins, timber, bitumen bricks, but the most likely solution would be to line the shaft with dried clay plaster, which is then covered with waterproofing animal fats or bitumen, as often used by their neighbours, the Sumerians. After a layer is completed, a gully is built around the perimeter of the upper level. It is made watertight by lining the floor and walls of the gully with mud and let the scorching Egyptian sun bake the clay dry. Once dried, the gully can be filled with water. Levels can again be taken and extra mud applied to the gully floor to make minor adjustments. The lift shafts would be extended to join the gully. Blocks can then be floated up the shaft and into the gully and then be floated anywhere around the pyramid. The most difficult part of pyramid building is raising the multi-ton blocks hundreds of feet into the air, which the water shaft does relatively easily. Once the blocks are up to the high level, they can just be pulled on rollers or dragged on a wet mud floor into position. But as water-filled gullies would already be in place to check the structure for levelness, it could be extended and used to float the blocks directly into position. Due to the enormous amount of blocks on the lower levels, a lift shaft would be built on all four sides to speed up the erection process. The perimeter casing blocks are floated into position first, and then a small wall is built on top to form a gully. This image shows how the pyramid site would look during erection. A deep water gully would be required the majority of the floats are stacked on top of the blocks. They could then be positioned tied next to each other as pictured. If, however, the float significantly sail past the side of the blocks, a shallower gully system could be used and positioned as in the picture. There is significant evidence that spring water bubbled up under the pyramid, fed from the water of the significantly higher Lake Maris as a natural spring from the lake lies directly underneath the pyramid. A tunnel could have been built down to improve water flow, and as the pyramid structure rose, internal tunnels were extended to help the water flow to higher levels. As the pyramid got higher, water pressure would slowly reduce, so smaller extension channels were built upwards from the king and queen's chamber to raise the water even higher, to eke out as much water as possible. If this was the case, then the water could have been gravity fed through the interior shafts in the Great Pyramid, filling the upper gullies and shafts. Only the highest few levels would need the water bucketing up. If the spring waters were not available, then lines of people could pass buckets of water up the structure. It is likely that these workers would be shaded by reeds suspended above them to protect them from the heat of the sun. There are multiple ways for raising water, from the manual approach seen here in the picture, or using the Shaduth method, as seen here from 19th century Egypt. 
or they could even use oxen pulling bucket laden ropes. As a comparison, the standard domestic outdoor hose pipe can deliver around 15 litres a minute compared to the 600 litres a minute using buckets. If a 10 litre bucket is passed in one second, then 100 litres could be passed in 10 seconds. 600 litres a minute per line. At the higher levels of the pyramid, smaller blocks were used for construction. Therefore, a water shaft would equally reduce in size, using less material the higher we go. Here we see how the completed pyramid would look without the centuries of wear that we see today. The white limestone of Tura would shine in the sunlight. Here we see the traditional view of pyramid building, with thousands of men dragging staggering weights up an enormous ramp which would take millions of tons of material to construct. Once completed, this enormous ramp would need to be demolished and the material dispersed compared to the easily demolished lift shafts which could be smashed from above and act like a rubbish chute. Evidence is beginning to surface that lends itself to the theory of using water shafts for moving the blocks to the pyramids. The picture you see here is of a roofed causeway that was discovered near Snefru's Bent Pyramid. The walls are almost 3 metres in height and 2.5 metres wide. This type of causeway is just like the kind that Chris imagines with his theory. Well, how about this? Here we see the well-preserved causeway at the Pyramid of Eunice. Why were the walls built so strong and thick, and such large roof slabs used just to create a walkway? Even National Geographic have posted a story on the discovery of a canal linking the Aswan Quarry to the Nile River. Another article in the Telegraph reports that scientists have discovered the secret that allowed Angkor Wat, a famous 1,000-year-old temple complex in Cambodia, to be constructed far faster than should have been possible, using canals. Could this technique have been widespread in the ancient world? Further evidence of the use of water can be found in these photos from John Kagman that show salt in the structure as well as water erosion in the lower chambers. Compelling new evidence is now coming to light that there were significant large high pressure springs bubbling up on the Giza Plain at the time the pyramids were built. These high pressure springs were fed by a huge underground aquifer, fed at the time with a faster running deeper Nile. We also have supporting evidence to the flotation theory and the discovery of connection bosses. As you can see in the image, these bosses have been found on various pyramid blocks, much like the modern day lifting lugs. Because of their orientation, it is clear that they would be used to suspend the blocks from above, as would be the case with flotation. Other evidence that lends credence to the flotation theory is the fact that Throughout the pyramid structure, salt and water-based impurity has been found. This points towards the notion that there was a lot of water contained at some point within the pyramid structure. Finally, it has been known for some time that the Great Pyramid has very subtle concave sides. This is only visible with the correct lighting conditions as seen here. Could this be evidence of the water shaft? For a deeper look into the water shaft theory, then please read the book. All right. All right, that was great. Uh, we learned so much today. Thank you, Michael. Are you opening up for questions? Anybody have any questions? So, I mean, this word theory sounds very plausible. 
Not a listen to this. <laughs> uh, I, I have one reservation. I, uh, it wasn't clear to me from this video how they deal with the water pressure, because if they build this uh, several tens of meters up, corresponding with several uh, atmospheres pressure at the bottom of this uh, uh, canal. And uh, using flat surface, flat walls uh, will not work. It will blow out. So it should be something pipeline-like or some other uh, way of enforcing this. So, but, or you can have shorter channels, smaller height, like, you know, in skyscrapers, you don't have water pump or pumping water to the upper floor. You have water pump pumping, maybe say 20th floor. And then from there, there will be a tank with uh, uh, free surface. And then from there, another 20th floor, something like this. So you have to, you leave the pressure right. uh, and so, similar consideration should be used here it's probably doable it's maybe not was not fully addressed in this video but uh, approach in general seems very interesting hmm. so what's interesting also and it's a known fact that some of the layering for the blocks were so thin that you could not even pass a razor, especially inside, inside of the uh, uh, the chamber. Uh, mm -hmm. They were layered layered next to each other, so it's plausible the water wouldn't pass through the mm -hmm. holes. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. Say that again, Zach. It was so thin. The the space between blocks when they were layered together. Yes. Couldn't even pass a razor between them, especially in the chamber section. That's how thin they were. Uh, the space. Wow. Hmm. That's that. Um, yeah. Uh, anybody else? Any other questions or additions? No. Say it's a tremendously creative solution. You know, it's got so many different aspects to it that seem to solve problems. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm certainly not in a position to, to judge it, but it, it was a tremendous piece of real creative work to come up with that. Mm -hmm. I think it was 4,500 years ago. <laughs> you know, there's- so I'm just talking about whoever came up with, with this concept. Yeah. You're thinking about, uh, as I said, I mean, if you go back 4,500 years, there's a mammoth still was rolling the earth in Siberia, so. <laughs> yeah, we, know, we, we know that, you know, the ancients were pretty good moving water around, right? Mm -hmm. That was, you know, the, the ancient civilizations all had tremendous uh, hydraulic engineering capability. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to add to that, I keep talking about my virtual trips. They showed how that theory of the water running up, you know, for their, water resources and how the Romans and that and Pompeii, they all did that. Aqueducts. Yeah, uh, maybe the main reason I uh, may doubt about this is there is no traces in, uh, in anybody's evidence. It's all uh, modern approach. Uh, neither Herodotus nor Sicalus or anybody else uh, no, no, no papyrus remains. With... But I, I got to say, I, I don't, I don't really see that as being a substantial objection, because I mean, essentially, you got to realize that that we're about as close to Herodotus as Herodotus was to the pyramids. Yeah, you know, so right. it's really not right to call him a witness. You know, he was a witness to whatever somebody had to say to him. Yeah, in in Egypt, you know, in 450 BC. Uh, and there's no reason to think that there was any uh, communication of engineering techniques over that period of time. Uh, Paul, I agree with this, but hard to imagine there will be no, no trace in uh, people's memory that this approach was used. Well, I mean, the, the, the issue I think could be, and you see this in, in complex industrial organizations for, for enormous period of time 
is that they spent so long kind of incrementing their engineering, uh, you know, sort of experimentation, testing, approaches, doing that um, other parties, once this was sort of disconnected and they never learned this and they, you know, this could seem so sophisticated, right? It's like, unless you're a, a you know, practicing theoretical physicist and someone dumps you a bunch of sort of, you know, physics data and a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, formulas and a bunch of sort of equations and proofs. I mean, you're just not going to know what you're going to do with it, right? And and so, I mean, there, to me, it's, it is feasible that you, you have for several thousand years such sophisticated sort of incremental uh, improvement in engineering. And, and this was clearly a, um, you know, an aim at a, at, a, at a national power level, right? So this was always very, very sort of pr highest priority or one of the highest priorities. And, and I can imagine once people were disconnected from that experience, they, they you know, and, and they didn't know how to do that type of engineering, that trying to rediscover that and try to maintain that could be sort of overwhelming. It, it, just, it, it just wouldn't make sense. And, and I mean, you see this today. I mean, you see it in things today where people, you know, like in places struggle to make things that they made 30 years ago. Uh, you know, they, they don't have the- We have a lot of examples of, of major pieces of knowledge disappearing. Yeah. You know, so the Greeks forgot how to write sure. for 400 years. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, the the- the Egyptians had uh, experienced something that they called the first intermediate period between mm -hmm. the Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, which they describe mm -hmm. as a time of complete chaos and famine uh, and, and loss of, of centralized government and warlordism and so forth. You know, so uh, it, it doesn't seem to me to be, you know, something that you, that you can dismiss out of hand that these engineering techniques were mm -hmm. lost. I mean, the engineering that was involved in building classical uh, structures mm -hmm. was inconceivable in Europe for a thousand years afterwards. Exactly. Could be. Could be. Uh, it just came to my mind, Paul, you know, um, I don't know where you were uh, at this part at the beginning of the presentation. I mentioned that uh, 11 of the 18th largest pyramids were built in uh, Old Kingdom during the from third to fifth dynasties. And then after intermediate, first intermediate period, as you mentioned, then there were in Middle Kingdom, there were only three pyramids, or oh, sorry, five pyramids with substantially smaller size. And then uh, the last two of these 18 largest pyramids were built in third intermediate period. So uh, could be if if this knowledge was lost, then all the smaller pyramids were able to be built using so-called normal techniques. Yeah, brute force. And, and I think there's there's something about it isn't just having knowledge like written in a book. It's highly experiential. Right. And so if you don't have this ongoing experiential activity, you lose that muscle memory to be able to do these things. And, and I mean, you see this, you see this in, in, in the modern world. I mean, this is not something that is, um, I mean, you see it with bridge building, right? In the United States, we used to build like basically more bridges than anyone ever did until the Chinese, uh, you know, have done what they've been doing the last 30 odd years. And we don't build bridges uh, like we did before. We, you know, it takes us 10 times longer if we're lucky. And um, and we have more challenges than we than, than we used to do, and 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 it's it there is something about the ongoing active, um, you know, uh, uh, creation and experimentation in engineering, and when you when that collapses, you know, you know, 80, 90, 100 uh, percent, just because things are written down and you can see something doesn't mean that you can just sort of flip the switch and go back and do that. Um, and, and, you know, Khufu's chief architect, I think that was Imhotep, was deified. Yeah. Right? They made him into so, uh, uh, Khufu's chief architect was Heman. 
and there was also a, an Imhotep uh, who was maybe the, the predecessor's Im uh, architect in Saqqara. Right, Imhotep was the, the one who built Joseph pyramid, yes. The, the Bet pyramid. And so in any event, these people were seen to have supernatural powers. Mm -hmm. Lifting, you know, having water go up even today seems like, you know, I mean, when you first showed the uh, the diagram, I was going, ah, oh, they couldn't do that. You know, uh, and I know about water pressure and atmospheric pressure. Um, Mikhail, can I ask you, and gentlemen and ladies, I have a thought. With all of the, for you to do this presentation, you gathered information from a lot of sources. Would we have been able, and I'm thinking of the kids today being educated, would you have been able to bring all this information together if you didn't have social media? I'm just my, I mean, I'm a stream of consciousness here because well, it, it we would be, not, Order of magnitude uh, more difficult because you have to go to a library to find stuff. It just physically you have to, this book should be available and so on. And then to compile the presentation, you, how you, today on the computer, you copy paste certain things and create PowerPoint and so on. It's, yeah, uh, it would be tremendously more different, difficult without uh, today. I mean, yeah, and, and it would be like a typed presentation to us. Right. Right? We'd right. have handouts. I'm just thinking of the, the uh, students of today and how differently they would be taught about the pyramids. Well, the interesting we thing taught. is that the students today have all these tools, mm -hmm. you know, at their disposal. And at the same time, the, the, the same things that created these tools are, are eating away at their powers of concentration. Not true. Their ability to focus on anything. So, you know, it's good news and bad news. I mean, too much information. It's so, always the case. You have to pay for it. No, no, right. no, no free lunch. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, it was Socrates who, uh, who denounced writing. Right. Right. right? He because he said that writing would spoil people's memory. Now, he was he right did. about that. It did yeah, spoil wow. our memories. You know, and even now, I mean, I'm, you know, I remember that when I was a kid, I knew the phone numbers of all of my close friends. Right. I, now right. I barely know my own phone number. Yeah. And and, and, also, to. and as far as counting, I was able to count in my head easily and quickly and without mistakes. Today, uh, I hardly remember two by two. <laughs> but, but I mean, let's be honest, it, it also provides us, and I think that's always what it comes down to, this freedom to be able to do things like this or whatever yes. this version is to someone, which to a kid might be, you know, some sports thing or gaming thing or whatever it is. Like, who cares? It's Yeah, I sort of went off topic, but it interests me. Yeah. Right. I mean, sure. I mean, the point is that the, the power is there, the, the, you know, the tool is there, but at the same time, you know the the um what's seductive in our society are entertainments and and that sort of stuff and once again that's a, a historical that's phenomenon new. of new, the advanced though. civilization comes along and basically root, roots you know uh, eats away at at in uh, um at in, uh, at the the you know i'm thinking of the greeks and the romans mm -hmm. uh you know of of luxury comes in and and uh all of a sudden you start having yeah you, know, you don't recognize your population anymore right you know? i mean that's always this 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 challenge in renewal between traditionalism and, and traditionalist society i mean people and, talk about how a primitive person would would you know allow allow an arrow to be pulled out of their arm with less of a of a fuss that somebody makes today for a splinter huh? Sure. But I mean, you know, I don't think most of us want to go back to a world where I'm not saying that we do. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that we do want to go back. I'm just saying that, you know, it's it's a complicated mess and you can't get the bad stuff without the good stuff. Right. Yeah, and you that's... can't get the good stuff without the bad stuff is what I mean to say. Yes. Yeah. Going back to the pyramids, a couple of questions. Um, there was a well-documented um, uh, in the med medieval time, you know, a lot of the uh, Arabic mythology was 
Mm -hmm. So much gold inside of this pyramid. Zach, could you speak up? I'm sorry. Uh, so in Arabic tales, mm -hmm. yeah, in Egypt, the medieval time was, um, you know, there was a slew of, uh, so hearsay, so to speak, there was a lot of gold and diamonds and all that other stuff inside the pyramids. So, uh, and I know the pyramids during the Arab conquest were robbed blind, especially mosques were built, a lot of the limestone coverage mm -hmm. or coating was used to, to build mosques in Egypt and Cairo in medieval times. And also they would, that um, entrance to Hufa was not an actual entrance. It was an entrance that was exploded by the um, Arab, you know, Arab conquestors, so to speak. It was, it was a, so to speak, a thief, thief's en entrance just to see what's inside. I was didn't find anything, but it's interesting in an aspect that, you know, even before our time, you know, when it came to our time, all of these pyramids were uh, completely disseminated, so to speak, and they don't look the same as they should have looked with coating and shining in the sun and all that stuff, because otherwise, if you would look at it in the original space right now, they will look absolutely tremendous um, in that regard. I'm just, anybody well, you know, go ahead. The, the, the reuse of, of building materials is, is, was so universal that when archeologists now look for ancient walls, they don't expect to find any stone. They just look for ditches. Right, the ancient ditches survive, hmm. and but the, but the 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 local people, you know, carted away all the stones and used them to build their houses or whatever else they needed it for. Right. Yeah. So right. stuff gets reused like crazy. I mean, that was, you know. Yeah, and interesting. Also, Michael had mentioned in the beginning that uh, in our textbooks in Russia. They said 100,000 people were used, you know, uh, and then we've heard millions also, to, but you only could use 10 to 20,000 at a time. Herodas also said it was what, 200,000 they were used or something like that? So uh, Herodotus, Herodotus say 400,000. 400,000, yeah. It's, but it's, I mean, I, I think we're underestimating um, the where the the wherewithal of, the, let me finish with it, the wherewithal of anyone that uh, would be doing this on a consistent basis. I mean, this type of work would be as extreme as any work we've done as a human being. And so the amount of, of um, you know, of, of, of you know, death, injury, et cetera, would be very high. So you could get to those larger numbers, just you would get to them in like, a thousand a week, you know, a thousand a month, maybe probably not a week, but whatever, it'd be like a thousand a month that basically out of those 20 to 40,000, you're probably losing a thousand of those a month. And so you have, you know, every, you know, four years, you're recycling these, you know, 20 to 40,000. So over a course of, you know, decades, you could get to those larger numbers. I mean, there's nobody is doing this seven days a week, 12 hours a day, for 50 years straight. I mean, you know, go, go look at your, at your normal commercial, um, you know, uh, large tower electrician. I mean, they're, they, they're struggling to do this work in their fifties and it's clearly not as difficult as this work. So it's, you know, it's, it's like, this is a younger person's game, you know, like 15 to probably 35, you know, or 14 or 13 or whatever, you know, and so you have to just do doing the timeline, you're going to be cycling through independent of people and a, don't underestimate accidents, right? It isn't like they didn't, they did everything right. I mean, no one ever does everything right. So you had accidents clearly at some percentage um, that were significant. Um, so I, I think, you, you know, getting through large volumes of humans to get this is, I, I don't see any other way to, that you would have gotten there. And, you know, uh, on, on the question of ancient slavery, um, the, the, uh, and the idea that, that the, the people who built the pyramids weren't slaves. I think I completely agree with that, but that doesn't mean they were free citizens 
who made a choice to say, okay, I'm going to sign up to build a pyramid. The, right. the, the, the typical way that those societies worked were that they would uh, obtain from their, their population what was called corvée labor, basically forced labor. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that you would for some portion of the year, some significant portion of the year, especially times when there was no immediate agricultural requirement for work, <laughs> you were drafted. So they were free, but they weren't free. It was really right. unfree. And let me also say that, that um, there's an ideological component that's really important. These things were huge, religious, had huge religious spiritual significance. So people were basically told that they were performing the will of the gods to do all this stuff, that this was kind of the, the price that they paid for fertility of the soil and for the annual flood of the Nile. Uh, so uh, everything that they, could, that they had in the society would be mobilized in order to, you know, to, to get people to uh, do what the people at the very top of the metaphorical pyramid wanted to do when they built the literal pyramid. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was also an interesting point also, the pyramid Hofa or in, in Greek as I use, you know, Heops. Uh, what is the remain from that pharaoh? Is this little statuette <laughs> that's like literally maybe 15, 20 inches or something like that. Well, and Cheops is no... Khufu, isn't he? Yeah, Khufu. Yeah. He is Khufu. Yeah. yeah, one statuette is left, like maybe 10 yeah. inches. Three, three inches. Nothing yeah. else <laughs> of him. And the, and, the, and the memory of the pyramid. So it's incredible how nothing survived except. Well, there, there, there are people. There are there are theories that the face of the Sphinx, is the face of Khufu. I don't. I can't evaluate that, but I've certainly I've certainly read that. Right. It could be. I mean, I, you know, that, again, that's a. It was a complex that was built. It wasn't just pyramids. There were shrines and, you know, uh, people servicing it, and there was a lot of stuff that were built to the pyramids, it was a complex of, you know, you would think uh, of different things that they needed for pyramids. And, and I think the Sphinx, unlike, you know, I mean, they had that, that theory about the pyramid being built out of the living rock. I think that that's actually true for the Sphinx. Wow. The Sphinx was, you know, that the ground around the Sphinx was, was excavated. So leaving the Sphinx. I have a question on the instrument they use, right? They use copper, right? They'd have to. That's all they had. But copper, isn't that soft? Mm -hmm. Terribly soft. It is. it is. They probably could use it about 10 minutes before they had to sharpen it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Mac, can, you, can you mute Ava? Because uh, we're hearing the background. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Mac. Sorry, guys. Okay. From what I read, uh, they used a significant part of the force, labor force, was used to maintain the cutting instruments. It has to, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that we can't forget is that the logistics trained for this. So you could have the people working specifically on, you know, let's say the 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 temple construction, but you're going to have this enormous logistics train around the region that are providing um that are developing and and providing instruments uh that are 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 are, are pulling um uh you know uh, uh granite uh you know and and moving that that are documenting that are training people that are recruiting people i mean this is like a whole you know industrial ecology that, mm -hmm. that grew up around this. So that's where I think you can get to these much larger numbers. Uh, well, the, there is no contradiction because I believe uh, Herodotus, when uh, he gives this 400,000 number, uh, he mentions total and current uh, people based on today's techniques, well, today's projected into the past. They say simultaneously all the 10,000 people could work. Which which corresponds to each other. So yeah, if you replace ten thousand people in several months, you will come up with these numbers. And, and also, we can't forget you had all the other um, temple complexes, many right. of which we probably haven't even found yet. 
And so these were all maintained also. I mean, you had this, you know, I mean, this thing was, you know, I mean, it was like the New York City of the world, right? And, right. you know, of temples. And so, you know, it wasn't like there was just putting up one, you know, like they were just working on one temple and then like nothing else existed. Mm -hmm. It was all of this whole system end to end. You know, it was, it was like, this was their, um, you know, like this was their, Silicon Valley of temples. <laughs> I, must, I must say this hydraulic theory, you know, it's like when you look at this and look at this and look at this, you just kind of feel that there was something missing. There had to be some kind of thing that that uh, had a, you know, an order of magnitude effect on decreasing the amount of labor that was necessary to get this done. Because, it, you know, these these calculations of, you know, uh, of you know one ton a, a minute for 35 years when you, when they took it. yeah i mean it's just it just really it's hard to imagine it, it just seems unbelievable and the the idea that that we're missing something that there was something that really was a, a you know that changed everything that made this a um, more of a feasible project that seems like a really attractive part of that theory can I say something? Can I say something really quick? Of course, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, because um, it's been everything's been so interesting. But um, I I um, know that um, the stones for the pyramids, from what well, from what I heard, I don't know is is right or wrong. That it's cut so precisely. Um, I mean, I know that the, the problem with the transportation or the, the moving the stones are so heavy, but just, you know, people, were, I, I believe I heard that just that they don't, they can't even figure out how they even cut the stones so precisely. You well, know, that was even, one of the things that yeah. was so attractive about the hydraulic yeah. theory was yeah. that, that yeah. They, they could use the water as a leveling mm -hmm. mechanism and they mm -hmm. could, they could um, basically shave everything down to be completely flat relative to the water surface and then they had that thing where they invert those stones into those notches so they could cut uh, identical angles also once again based on the fact that that you know that water is flat yeah to gravity so those, those but the, really... the instrument the instrument used to yeah you can measure the 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 you know measurements right but the instruments that's used to cut because they 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 say that um it's so precise that and it it does it doesn't look like there's any repetition it's yeah, just what i'm saying is that is that you know yes that's true if the thing was freestanding and you're standing there with a tape measure and a saw or something <laughs> but if you could imagine this block sitting in water and the, the water level is exactly where the block is supposed to be cut and you gradually take it down so it's exactly at the level of the water. Mm -hmm. Right, but, the, but how to cut how the, the, the cutting method, of course you can measure it to precise, but I mean, there's so many mysteries. Yeah, but but I, I think one of the things that it, it's, it, it, I, I mean, I'm sure this is sort of a, a very slow walk of discovery is that they, they clearly created some kind of templating systems right and some type of modularity so mm -hmm. that they could get you know i mean i'm just making it up but they could say this isn't you know they have their own language obviously but this is an a1 block versus a b1 block versus a c1 block and then everybody once it's been identified as as whatever those you know 25 different templates then goes and does the work to fit within that template and they test it again against the right the idea know, that they you know if they if they could measure one Yep. And then they could duplicate it. That's right. You know, just like in the same way that when, right. you know, when they, uh, the artists developed the use of multiple compasses to draw That's right. you know, concentric circles, you know, that, that this idea of, of having one model and then being able to duplicate it without un having to measure each one separately. That's mm -hmm. what's part of what's so attractive about this theory. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing too is that you have this, um, you know, it, it, it being able to make it consistently modular, but also test it where you're cutting it, like before mm -hmm. you try to take it anywhere, you, you, mm -hmm. you do this sort of, you know, just like, you know, real engineers do, they will mm -hmm. do this sort of 
offsite test of, or as much as they can to create that that, that fit for purpose uh -huh. validation. And I, I I have to imagine there was you know where that could be applied. I'm sure there were certain conditions because of the uniqueness of 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 of, of certain. Uh, boulders that you couldn't do that, but I, I'll bet for an enormous amount of what was very standardized that they could do that. Uh, I have a apply? question to everybody. Uh, we uh, we can discuss how this was built, whether it was uh, water or ramp or crane or all together. But what astonishing is astonishing me the most is how they recorded the design. That's Absolutely no, no answer. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Are they what, Michael? How they recorded the design. Recorded? Of, well, you have to design the thing and then you have to lay out the design and not just, it cannot be that one person has this in his head. Yeah. This design should somehow be laid out. Uh, today it would be in computers and papers. Yeah. There, they had some papyrus, but can you imagine all the amount of well and, and and my guess is they <laughs> we haven't discovered this but i would not be shocked if they had models i mean it, it, it i don't know why they wouldn't have models right it, it it you know and create you know their version of one you know fifty thousandth or whatever right, but know. those models wouldn't wouldn't record the same stresses Right. No, 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 no. That's a one fifty thousand model. It's not going to collapse from. I understand place. that, but that's but you can't even get to stresses if you don't even have a design model, right? right. So, like right. you have but to get to. There, as you say, then you have there, things like the bent pyramid. Is there any suspicion? I, I actually have suspicion that they they would try to destroy all the methods of how they build it because. That's what happened in China with the. That's a good point. The, That's an interesting point. The, and yeah. they actually kill all the people who built. They they found a a, a mound, yeah. and then they thought it was a like a like a hill, and then it turned out to be a mass grave. So maybe they. I would. Yeah, the same thing with the terracotta army, right? I mean, so it's yeah. like. Yeah. You had that, you know. Uh, we we had similar things in Russia. You know, this uh, on the Red Square, there is this temple with all these very elaborate uh, cupolas and so on. And uh, people who build this, uh, they were uh, made blind for, for nobody to repeat this. No, I mean, it, 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 if you had to, um, you know, if you were worried about trademark and intellectual property in the old world, then the easiest thing to do is get rid of the people who have the trademark and intellectual property. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's sort of like 1.0, you know, sort of patent law, you know, and, and but, you're not having to worry about. Yeah, but I, I think it's more about the treasures inside a tomb that they don't want people to. Well, but that goes back to, I think, what, what Paul was talking about is the is the significance religiously, right? So it wasn't just sort of treasures because it was gold or it, it had sort of material value. It was such a religious significance to to the Egyptian people. I mean, the idea was that the the pyramid was a reincarnation machine. Exactly. Right? Yeah, it exactly. was the machine that would allow the king yep. to cross over, and then he would basically be the sal the salvation yeah. for all the regular people. So right. you know, everybody had a stake in the king surviving <laughs> to the next world where he would uh, you know then help help uh, everybody else. I mean, he had very similar um components not the same exact ones uh, uh, within the aztecs right so you know it's it's it, it, so you you would do a lot to protect that and it wouldn't just be we don't want someone to repeat well if you think creating this structure helps you get closer to god you absolutely want to prevent someone else from creating a structure very similar to that um and you also want to hide whatever is the most valuable thing to create that relationship to that super God status. Um, and so, I mean, it makes total sense that-, that You know, that it's, it's kind of like um, hacking the colonial pipeline. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you've, got, you've, got, you've got everybody that's trying to encrypt, you know, the, the Pharaoh's sarcophagus. And that's then right. you've got these hackers that come along who figure out how to break it. Usually the hackers win. And it also contributes to the fact that, let's say, you know, uh, Hufu or um, 
you know, Joffrey's, whenever the pyramid was finished and the, the pharaoh dies, the new pharaoh wants to build a new one, right? So it was, uh, they weren't going back to rebuilding, you know, Hufu, because what's interesting is they're going for a new pharaoh. Now they're contributing to a new one. So but you maybe, notice each one is progressively smaller. It yeah. progressively smaller. <laughs> Until yeah. they realize that they, I think essentially that they've, they've bankrupted all of the resources of the country and they just have to come up with something entirely new, you know, mm -hmm. on a much, much smaller scale. Yeah, but that's actually poses a question. Was it a building project to give people jobs? Maybe. No, 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 no. no. This was, this was a completely dead weight, you know, take all the all the the resources and and flush them down the toilet that's what they were doing yeah yeah but you were if you if you had a god cult society yeah. right? right that was right. that which, was your foundation it, it, that's our normative view of anyone who does that but for yeah, their as, as as marx marx would not classify that as being capital right yeah was, but i don't think pure, you're worried about pure, marx. pure pure rose you know uh, uh no, no unproductive no, surplus no added value here. <laughs> yes, right. No, but there is an added value. It, it I is. Think there is. I, I disagree. I think there is. Yeah. Yeah, there's a yeah, huge you're added right, value. You're right. From the ideological standpoint, from the ability to organize society, yeah, but that's, collective that's the whole point in a civilization. I, I, I agree. I agree with you. You're right. You're right. You know. Um, so what, what's very fascinating is they that um, they've been they, they've had these sort of um, you know uh, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but sort of like funny, not funny, but it's real, but sort of uh, uh, this engineering challenge that they that they uh, send out every few years. It's this ongoing thing in the engineering, uh, architecture, academic world around it, where they, they they almost like try to put an RFP together, uh, a request for, for proposal for building a great pyramid. And they, and they all come back with these sort of estimates. The first estimates about 25 years ago came in at around 500 million bucks. The estimates uh, most recently have come back at five billion, um, you know, and, and people think you're kind of getting closer to what it would probably take. Um, so you're you're looking at, and, and of course this has no proof of value either, right? Like meaning, like can we actually do this? Uh, we, they, this would just be for the great big home run swing at it, and so you know, which means it would probably be twice as much money and probably would not maybe even work or be very, very hard to complete, you know, be like the, like the, like the big tunnel, you know, and uh, the big dig in Boston, right. Uh, yeah. was supposed to be done in whatever, six years and it took 18 years or something. And uh, there was a, there's a really interesting documentary about um, the uh, building of uh, rocket engines in the Soviet Union, where they came up, came up with a way of having a closed feedback system for the gases that were going out to feed them back in, whereas uh, the the United States uh, found that to be so unstable that they could not make it work, and uh, ultimately they came down to saying that the biggest difference was that the Soviets had an engineering perspective yep. of of trial and error, and the That's engineers right. ran the show. Whereas right. in the United States, the designers ran the show and they would come in and say, you have to get me, you know, uh, uh, you have to be accurate to one ten thousandths of, of an inch. And so we didn't bother with any of that. They said, OK, let's try this. That's right. Oh, it blew up. Let's do it again. That's you know, right. and, and they were they were smart and they were observant, you know, and they mastered it. And now they sell their engines to the West. Well, yeah. And so so one of the things that's pretty fascinating. So the the weight of the pyramid is 26 trillion pounds. So the amount of energy, I mean, uh, no, 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 I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, 13 billion pounds. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 13, 13, billion pounds. 13, um, uh, uh, 13 million pounds. No, 13 billion ah, pounds. Billion 13, pounds. Right. 13 right. billion pounds. Billion, billion. Billion, yeah. So, so um, and, and that's when, whenever they do these sort of engineering and architecture, and they, they do them all over the world. You can look them up where they're, they're all coming in with their weird estimates and they, they don't have any other project they can relate to. The closest thing in terms of energy is the space program, 
in terms of energy generated, but that's, uh, you know, that's obviously uh, biochemically generated, you know, liquefied, uh, uh, you know, gas and stuff. So, so that's, um, but, but so, so just most of them throw their hands up and say, we don't know how you work with something that's going to weigh 13 billion pounds. Like we just don't, we don't know how you, like, we just don't, can't, we, we can't figure it out. Like, and, and they're well, too afraid. Uh, Aaron, I, I, I probably disagree because uh, the big dams, like Hoover Dam or other dams, they probably have mass more than uh, pyramids. So well, yeah, but so, so, so the, so dams are unique, right? Because right. dams, have a continuous evolution in history that has been built on itself, whereas pyramids don't have that. Like we, we have to sort of rediscover it. Um, you know, so I, I think oh, that. But, but but that's the whole point is that they did have a continuous history in Egypt. No, no, we don't have a continuous history. Oh. I'm saying we, like us today. Like if we wanted to build I a see. pyramid today.